So graduation is a lot more fun these days and a lot more colorful. And we're in this new school era. So this, this graph down here is the extra money that banks have that they didn't have before. You notice that basically it was zero forever. And then during the financial crisis, we started shifting how the Federal Reserve worked with banks. And the first thing that they did was they started paying banks interest when the bank put its reserves at the Fed. So you would put your money into the Fed, the Fed pays you. Now you have a reason to put extra money away because you have a totally perfectly safe place to put your money. So if you're a bank and you you just been through this financial crisis and you know you're trying to get straight and things are not that good, you can give the Fed a little extra cash to hold for you and they'll pay you. So you're still making money on your money and it's 100% safe. Yeah. And so all of a sudden, banks start putting stuff in there, and we build this mountain. And then, you know, 2015 or so, the Fed starts trying to get, you know, banks to, yeah, so we start coming down the mountain. And then, of course, coronavirus, we jump right back up again. But the point is, we have a new system, a change system which is called an ample reserve regime. So we used to have fraction reserve regime or fraction reserve banking. Now we have an ample reserve regime. That means based on its own specific unique operations, we require banks to not even necessarily keep reserves, keep certain kinds of reserves, do things. It's a much more complex system it's designed to make sure that in a financial crisis that a bank can survive for a month at least without help. That when bad things happen, the bank can kind of cover everything for a while. All right? The old system was you just have to keep this money. Well, when times are bad, if you have to keep that money, now we got a problem, right? Think about that. Let's think about that. In the old system, you have to, let's say you have to keep 10%. So if times things are bad and people are pulling the money out of your bank, A, you only have the 10%, but B, you legally you have to keep it. Right? So you get to a point where people are pulling money out of the bank. The bank is required by law to keep stuff in the bank. We have a fundamental problem. It's... And, we have these things called bank runs where people literally run to the bank. That's why it's called a bank run. And everybody tries to take their money out. Well, the new Federal Reserve System, and again, we have the ne whole next chapter and um, three chapters from now, it's mostly about all this stuff. But now the Fed lets the bank be flexible. So the bank is holding stuff in case of trouble. And now it can use that stuff. It's not required to hold on to all this cash and have it in the bank, it doesn't get in legal trouble when an emergency happens and it uses its resources to cover the emergency. So hopefully this is a better system. We shall see. But hopefully it's a better system. It deals with individual banks and their individual operations in an individual way and gives the banks better flexibility to deal with problems that arise at the bank. Okay? It's the new school way. All right. So where does money come from? Where does all that M1, M2, you know, M4 and a half come from? Well, this is what how the banking system works, right? All these normal people over here. So you have normal people over here who have a little extra money or they have some money and they put that in the bank. So we call that deposits. So I put some money in the bank. You put some money in the bank. Everybody has some money in the bank. Right? And one day you spend it, you have less, but the next day you get more. And So your accounts are all going up and down. But you have all these people who are putting money into the bank. The bank then can pool that money, right? Pool a little bit of money from a lot of people 
and loan it out to other people. If you needed, you know, $300,000 to buy a house, well, it's hard to find friends that are all willing to get, it's complicated, right? Even even if if banks didn't exist and you wanted to buy a car and you needed to find $25,000 to buy a car, you might have trouble getting all your friends together to each give you, you know, a dollar a piece, 25,000 friends so you can buy that car. But the bank does that all the time. The bank takes a little bit of money from a lot of people and turns it into a loan. When the bank does that, it doesn't, if it's smart, it's not going to loan out. And in fact, it's required to not do this, right? Instead of loaning out every penny that it gets, it keeps some of the pennies that it gets in its reserves. And that should be based on all the transactions and how often people come back and the operations of the bank. But it's going to keep some of them, okay? That's the process of making loans. Do you notice something on this picture? Before we made the deposits, right? Before we made the deposits. Before we made the deposits. Ignore all these pennies over here. Just look at these pennies. We have seven pennies. That's all. But then I put my seven pennies in the bank the bank loaned out six pennies. Hmm. And the bank still has one penny. So now here's f seven pennies. Here's six pennies. Okay. We think we have seven pennies in the bank, right? I think I have six pennies to go buy a house. Between us, we have 13 pennies. The bank performed a miracle. The bank is like Harry Potter. Seven pennies went in. The seven pennies are still in the bank. You can go check your, your balance on your bank account, and it's, there's still seven pennies in there. And you can go to the store and spend them. But this person over here now has six pennies, and they can spend them. It's a miracle. Okay? The bank created money out of thin air. I often refer to this as air money in, in honor of Michael Jordan. The bank, through this process of making loans, actually creates money and increases the amount of money that's circulating in the system. Right? Because money is just bitses and bites in computers. Right? So the you put your money in, now you have these bits and bytes that say you own seven pennies, and the bank loans it out, and that means these people over here have bits and bytes that say they own six pennies, and now we have just turned seven pennies into 13 pennies. Okay? Let's do this a little more technically. So in the next 30 seconds or so, I will teach you everything that's important to know about accounting. In accounting, we have things called assets and liabilities. An asset is something that you own, and a liability is something that you owe to somebody else. So an asset is something that I own, a liability is something that I owe to someone. You hear these terms debits and credits in accounting? All that means is left and right. Debit means left, and credit means right. Left and right. Accountants want you to think that there's something complex. No. When you call up a company that will go credit your account, that just means they're going to make an entry on the right-hand side of your account. All right? Then there's two fundamental equations of accounting, one of which is you know profit equals uh, revenue minus cost. But the other, the more fun one, is kind of the farmer in the Dow. Everything you own, you owe. E-I-E-I-O. Everything you own, you owe. It's called double entry accounting. So there's always two entries whenever something happens two numbers change in your books because everything you owe everything you own you owe to someone now you could owe it to yourself but everything you own you owe and the way that shows up as an equation is that assets equals liabilities plus owner equity so your assets and liabilities plus the part of liabilities that you owe to yourself the owner's equity that's equal <gasps> and that's accounting that's it. You're done. Okay? There's no more to accounting than 
that it's simple. They just have to stretch it out for a couple semesters. But that's accounting. All right. So we can draw these accounts that are called T accounts. And they're called T accounts because right in the middle of the screen is the letter T. And we put assets on the left and liabilities on the right. And that gives us debits and credits. If we look at a bank, and your, your, your book has more detail-y stuff, but really, if we look at a bank, a bank has three kinds of assets. So a bank has cash that it holds itself or that it, the Federal Reserve is holding for it. It has loans that it's made. And then a bank has securities as assets. Securities could be uh, mostly bonds of different kinds that the bank could own. Okay, in theory, it could own stock or something, but securities, right? In general, we mean stocks, bonds, um, financial instruments of various kinds, loans, cash. So, cash, loans, securities. Those are the assets of the bank. And how do I know that those are assets? Why well, can sell those? So, if the bank has cash, they can use that cash to pay somebody something, right? If you have a loan, if you go get a home loan. And so you go to Bank of America and you get a home loan. If Bank of America needs cash, they can sell that home loan to somebody else. My particular home loan has been sold twice. So I'm on my third company that owns the bank part of my house. So I did literally start with Bank of America. And then I've been through two other financial institutions that own my loan. And all I get is a letter in the mail. And it says, on such and such a date, you have to send your payment here instead of to that other bank you were sending it to. And so you go online, you set up a new account at a new website, and your your house payments just go on, and it's just a different person. Your house payments don't change because you made a deal, and it's a contract, and they can't change it, but off it goes. Okay? What are the liabilities of a bank? Well, what does a bank owe people? Well, I put my money in my banking account. The bank owes that to me. So the vast, vast majority of the liabilities of any bank are its deposits. It owes those to people. Everybody who can come in, right? If the bank has a billion dollars in deposits, all those people can come in and ask for a billion dollars. Okay? Okay. Very exciting. The bank does not have a billion dollars, right? The bank has some of the billion dollars. If it's got a billion dollars in deposits, right? If you've got a billion dollars in deposits... The sum of these three things has to be a billion dollars. So if I have a billion dollars in, in deposits and I have a hundred million in cash and five hundred million in loans and four five hundred billion in loans and four hundred billion in securities, my accounting balances, because I got a billion on one side and a billion on the other, but if people come in to ask for their money, I've only got a hundred million dollars of the billion. All right. Now, it doesn't mean that necessarily bad stuff has to happen because I could sell those loans. I can do what we call call them in and make people pay them off. I can go sell my securities and I can start paying those people if I get the chance when they come in. Okay. All right. So let's suppose that a customer comes in and puts a thousand dollars in cash in the bank. So in comes you. You give me a thousand dollars in cash. I say on my computer, and I give you a, a account number and say, hey, you have account number one, and in account number one, there's $1,000. You go home, you look at your website, and it says you have $1,000, all right? From the bank's perspective, they now have cash of $1,000, which they own, and they owe you the $1,000 that's in your account. So we balance. We have $1,000 on the left and $1,000 on the right, all right? Okay, now let's make a loan. Let's make a loan of $800. And all I'm going to do, all I'm going to do to make that loan is somebody comes in and says, hey, I want to buy a car, and it costs $800. So they go, T -t 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 -t. and into the computer, they say, okay, you have account number two, and in account number two, there's now $800. All right? It's magic, right? They just created $800 out of thin air and gave it to you. They didn't have an extra $800, but they gave it to you anyhow, All right? So now we have $1,800 in deposits. In account number one, we have $1,000. In account number two, we have $800. So the bank has liabilities of $1,800 in deposits. It has $1,000 in cash. 
and it has $800 on a piece of paper that you signed that says, I owe you $800, or you can take my car. Okay? Is that exciting? It's pretty exciting. It can get even more exciting. Let's make a $4,200 loan just for fun. So another person walks in and says, hey, I'm starting a business. I need $4,200. And you go, Trrr. and they say, okay, you have account number three. And in account number three, there's now $4,200. Okay. We just magically created $4,200. Now the bank has three bank accounts, and in one there's $1,000, in one there's $800, and in one there's $4,200. So at the three accounts it has add up to $6,000. It owes the three of us, its customers, $6,000. It has $1,000 in cash, so it's praying we don't all come in and ask for our money right now. And it has two pieces of paper, one that says I owe you $800, and one that says I owe you $4,200. Yeah. Yeah. So again, the F word. Our banking system works because we have faith in it. We trust it. Okay. Yes. Hopefully, we trust it. And we have this money creation process. Most of the money that exists out in our system doesn't exist because somebody walked and put cash in a bank. It exists because the bank made loans, that loans created new money, and then that money went out into the system and did good things. Yeah, I can tell you're excited. This is very exciting stuff. Okay? When banks make loans, they create money. When banks, when you pay off your loan, you're actually destroying money. Hmm. All right. Your book talks about something called the simple deposit multiplier. Uh, no exist anymore. Just saying. Because we used to, in the fractional reserve banking system, we used to say, take the, what's called the reserve requirement, take the, you divide by the reserve requirement. Well, the reserve requirement is zero. So basically, you've turned the simple deposit multiplier the way we used to define it into some number that's just infinite. Really, it's not infinite. But the things that control how big it gets are not, there's not one thing. There's no way for us to look at what's going on in the financial system in the raw numbers and figure out what this money multiplier should be. We need to understand that banks are capable of creating money and they do it every day. And so every new dollar that gets put into the financial system potentially could create way more than one dollar. It could create three dollars or six dollars or eight dollars or right. And the Fed, of course, is watching what's going on to make sure that people don't get carried away trying to to do that. But there's no way for us to sit down and predict now what's gonna happen when we add a dollar into the system. 